Okay, so the penultimate episode of Better Call Saul has just dropped. The entry teases a lot of things for the finale, and in this breakdown, we're going to be doing a big recap, talking about some of the details in it, and also giving our theories for where things will head in episode 13. Full spoilers ahead from this point onwards, I want to get straight into it, but make sure you subscribe so you don't miss our big video on the finale next week. Without the way, a huge thank you for clicking this, now let's get into Better Call Saul. Now last week had Jimmy being stuck at a crossroads, and after hearing that Kim had asked about him, he decided to turn back around and reach out to her. We kinda had a feeling we'd see the other side of this conversation, and it's something that this entry heavily focuses on. The episode is very much about Kim cutting off all the ties to the past and relieving herself of the guilt that she's been carrying the last couple of years. The first part of severing herself off from her old version comes early on when we open with Saul in his office. She's here to get through their divorce papers and this is very much the first document in the episode that leads to a big transformation for her. We catch Saul throwing a ball off the constitution and also see his law degree from the University of American Samoa. American Samoa isn't a real university and the name on it, Saul Goodman, is of course also a fake one, showing how much of a facade this entire thing is. Got a lot of shining vibes here with him just bouncing the ball rather than being productive and he knocks down one of the columns further showing how fake this entire thing is. Saul is in one of his more garish suits yet and the salmon blazer, striped shirt and sh** tie arguably shows how hideous of a person that he's become. Yes, it's a reach, but from here on out, we cut to the title sequence. Again, this is heavily shortened down with us almost instantly skipping to the blue screen of death that you get when a VHS tape hits its end point. This of course signifies how the show is coming to a close, but we do get a glimpse of Jeff's cab, which becomes a big focus here. Now much in the same way that Jimmy has drastically changed every time he's taken on a new stage in life, we see how this has happened with Kim too. She's now missing the ponytail, has dyed her hair brown, and she's also become completely reserved in putting her opinion forward. She dates a bit, a bit, a bit of a douche, that wears a shirt with tigers on, wrap around sunglasses, and also says, yep, 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 during sex. Turns out he's just got back from the shop, but rather than bringing her mayonnaise, he's brought her miracle whip. This is symbolic on a number of levels, as it's a fake substitute for the real thing, that doesn't actually do the job it was intended to, much like Kim. That's the biggest ritual they with the video, well it's probably not, but the creative team always select things like this to hint out what the characters are really going through. Kim currently plays the perfect sap, and even though the miracle whip won't really work, she just goes along with it without protesting, because that's the kind of mind state she has. She's so toned down from what she used to be that she can't even make a simple decision on ice cream flavors. So maybe, what do you think? Vanilla or strawberry? Ooh, um, they're both good. <laughs> I know, right? Now it turns out that she does work at the sprinkler company that Victor rang last week and she's clearly not stimulated by the life that she now leads. She's stuck in the typical office environment, signing birthday cards for Tommy, making felt a coffee, and just having conversations that she already knows the answer to. It's clear she's not really been able to get back into her groove, and she finally makes a drastic decision after Victor gets in touch. Now she instantly knows it's him because of the name Victor St. Clair. In one of their scams, Kim went under the name Giselle St. Clair, which gives it away right from the off. Similar to the shot last week where we saw things from the outside, we too get that perspective here right at the beginning. Now it's a really awkward conversation in which Jimmy gradually baits her more and more and more. I'm still out here, still getting away with it. Feds couldn't find their own ass with both hands and a proctologist. You shouldn't be calling me. Now he very much has a hubris in this entry that's ultimately going to lead to him getting caught. Kim says he's probably not living a big life, which he also says back to her. Both have had a major fall from grace and Jimmy finally pushes her over the edge when he tells her to hand herself in. She actually does this in the episode, and ultimately both her and Marion are likely going to be the ones that end up bringing him down. You also have this moment where Jimmy talks about how all the people that will come after her are dead. What, what is stopping you? Brings in the ground. Mike's in the ground. Lalo's in the ground, apparently. Love this line about Lalo, as Saul of course didn't think that he was fully dead, and he constantly had PTSD that he was going to come back. She also ends the call with his heartbreaking goodbye. Kim. I'm glad you're alive. Now I honestly think that if he'd been more comforting or kind that he could have talked her out of it, 
but this call very much lights the match that sparks up the flame to make her clear her conscience. Nice metaphor here of the match used to spark up the candle on the book. So I did, t I did say some of the reaches would be pretty bad. Now she returns to Albuquerque and then goes to the courthouse. Whereas Mike once worked the barrier, we see that it's now automated with a credit card machine. She drops off the confession and also goes to Cheryl, where she tells her in black and white how they destroyed Howard's life. Such good direction here with the sound being completely absent while Cheryl reads, and we get these long takes over the text as we see certain segments of exactly what they did. It's all laid out, and seeing it presented like this makes you realise just how evil Jimmy and Kim were. They saw it as a big joke, but that all changed with the death of Howard. Now Kim says he didn't suffer, but it's clear that he has, which Cheryl brings up. The reputation they gave to Howard has ruined his legacy, but Kim's here to right the wrongs of it. However, she might not even get charged, as there's no physical evidence or witnesses, except for, you guessed it, Jimmy McGill. Now what this will lead to, we don't fully know, but I think it's clear that Kim is going to ask Jimmy to confess once he's finally locked up. With this being a legal show, I think that's the way things are going to go, and sure, we could see him killed or something else, but the more I think about it, the more I think that jail is where this all will head. We are very much dealing with the law and better call Saul, and what happens to those that break it. Even from season 1, Chuck tried to hammer home the point that it was sacred. Jimmy has overstepped that, and thus there's only one way he can really go, unless Marion knows some good websites for hitmen. Now Kim does a better breakdown than us, and after this we cut across to the other side of the robbery from last week. It's way, way simpler than what we thought it would be, with the police just stopping by to eat some fish tacos. Is it fish? I'll let you guys decide. Now in the house, we very much see how it's not so much about the crimes for Jimmy, as it is recapturing the sense of his old life. There's a reason he chose to target middle-aged wealthy men, and they are obviously stand-ins for Saul that could provide him with an avenue to the things that he used to have. He makes himself fancy drinks, looks over expensive watches, and it's not so much about taking them as it is about taking back his old life. He plays a single piano note to make sure the guy's fully conked out, but eventually he comes to the longer that Jamie snoops around. Upon realising that he's awake, he grabs his dog's urn to knock him out, and its name was Rusty, which might be because Jeff's rust. Look, we had a good one with the Miracle Whip, and it's all been downhill from there. Now, one thing that does kind of come back around is that Mike last week told Saul not to work with amateurs. This was very much in the case of Walter White, which led to the downfall of everything, including Gus and Saul's empire. This is the same case here, with Jeff leading to the downfall of Gene. He crashes right in front of the police whilst trying to act cool, which is the smoke that we saw last week. Now there's two ways of thinking over this that I've seen people talking about. Some think Gene told him to do deliberately so that he could get away. Others think it was due to nerves, but let me know exactly what you think in the comments below. Either way, he's the scapegoat, and Jeff ultimately ends up causing the collapse of everything. Cut back to Saul's office, where he and Kim go over the papers. Saul does that thing you'd do in primary school when he got an answer right on the spelling test, and it shows the disrespect he has for what's actually happening. This was of course mirrored in the phone call, and he just sits on his phone, completely ignoring the situation. Kim wants nothing other than to leave everything behind, and she doesn't even take her share of the money. Jimmy is completely cold towards her, and is it just me, or can anyone believe that a show called Better Call Saul, that's about Jimmy turning into Better Call Saul, finally saw him become Better Call Saul. I couldn't believe it. Now we also see someone you might remember in Emilio. This was Jesse's original partner in Breaking Bad, and his cameo is followed by Jesse himself. I was furious. Furious I was that Aaron Paul didn't look exactly how he did 13 years ago. And that's it. Show's going off. I'm not covering the finale. Can burn it all down. Now obviously, yeah, the guy's going to look older, and you kind of have to suspend your sense of disbelief and just, you know, just enjoy what we got instead of thinking about what we didn't. Now he has a cigarette with Kim, and the pair are of course very much the partners who ended up being pulled in by the kingpins, and because of this they had major aspects of their lives ruined. Of course they're their own people, and are also responsible for their own actions, but they were very much enabled by those who led them down the darker path. He asks Kim if Saul is good, and Kim says, When I knew him, he was. Great line of dialogue, and in one of our many parallels, we catch Gene getting the bus. Both he and Kim live the high life, and having to ride the bus, of course signifies their fall from grace. 
Not slagging off riding buses yet. I couldn't even drive until I was 29, so I did ride a lot of them. But yeah, I think they did this for a reason. Back at Jeans, he pours himself a drink and puts his feet up, but this time he doesn't turn on the police radio, showing how relaxed and in control that he is. Gene probably knows deep down that he's going to get caught, but he doesn't really care because he has nothing to lose. He gets a call from Jeff pretending to be his son, who tells him that the guy ended up telling the police that he's been robbed. I don't know how they could pin this on Jeff, as he didn't have any stolen goods on him, but either way, it makes Jimmy go to Marion. She obviously brought up how Jeff got in trouble in Albuquerque, and this too is brought up again. Unfortunately, Jimmy slips up and brings up Albuquerque himself, which triggers Marion to investigate where he comes from and so on. She of course saw them last week, and though Jean seemingly smooths it over, she starts to look into him. We cut to Jimmy listening to the tide is high by Blondie, which is about someone sailing through rough waters, but they're still sticking in there, much like how Jimmy is. Though the song talks about dealing with difficulty, it's really laid back and relaxing, much like how Jimmy is really close to getting caught, but he's extremely relaxed about it. Now Marion has upgraded from cat videos to commercials, and Jimmy opens her laptop to see his old videos playing. We bloody called it, but there's such a good little artistic thing that they do here. Whilst the scene itself is in black and white, we can see that the commercials are in colour because that relates to his old life. Such a brilliant way to depict him looking back at his more colourful past that holds a lot of symbolism to it. He's caught, can't talk his way out of it, and if he's willing to lie about Nippy, and who knows what depths he won't sink to. I also love how Marion has a telephone wire plugged into the laptop that she then unplugs and puts into her phone. You kids don't know how lucky you are with Wi-Fi. We had to do this all the time back in my day. Now Gene rips this out the wall, and though it seems like he could be, you know, do, doing it up to strangle her, I actually think that he was just doing it to tie her up. However, this location is important, as it's the same kitchen where she joked about him killing her in the first episode they met in. He says, I trusted you, and this makes him massively drop his guard. Marion sounds the alarm, and she says Saul Goodman is in her kitchen, which makes him flee, ending the episode. We then cut to a preview of him in colour beside a destroyed car, and over the top of this, we can hear him attempting to get himself a new identity. Hoover, pressure pump, X Astra, Model 60. Will it work? I doubt it, as he sounds really messed up, and this crash doesn't look like it's going to have left him in the best of shapes. I think that he'll probably have been chased by the authorities, will have gone off the road, and now be desperately trying to get a new identity before time fully runs out. We'll see what happens next week though, and obviously I'd love to hear your thoughts and theories on where you think stuff is going to go. Comment below and let me know, and just to let you know, we're running a competition right now, you're giving away 3 copies of Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness on the 15th of August. All you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the episode. Pick the comments at random on the 15th, the winners of the last one are on screen right now, so you know I'm not lying, it's not a Saul Goodman con. And uh, yeah, make sure you get involved because I love you guys forever. If you want something else to watch, then check out our breakdown of Sandman, which will be linked on screen right now. That's another good show that's just dropped on Netflix, so definitely go head over there right after this. By the way, thanks for sticking through the video. I've been Paul. I'll see you next time. Take care. Peace.